Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be going through some of the basic statistical concepts you'll need to know for finance. Let's start off with population and samples. So a population is all the possible members of a group. So we could think of, let's say, the United States, the entire population of the country. And then a sample is a subset group of that population. So let's say we wanted to find out what percentage of people in the U.S. are each of the major religions, like uh, Christian, Jewish, etc. So what you'd think you'd have to do is look at the entire population, go ask every person in the United States what's their religion, and then you'd have this perfectly accurate estimate. But that is impossible. You can't ask every single person of the 330 million people. So what you need to do is you need to come up with a smaller group because that's the only way that you'll really get the information you need. So you're going to maybe come up with a, a sample size. So the U.S. has 330 million. You might go out there and get like 5,000 people and you're going to make some assumptions, um, but you're going to try to form some sort of conclusion about the larger group of people based on this small subset. Typically in finance, we're looking at parameters and sample statistics when it comes to stats. Okay, so a parameter is a measure used to describe a population. And usually in finance, we're looking at mean returns or standard deviation of mean returns. Now, that would be a parameter if we're looking at the mean return of, for example, the entire U.S. stock market. But a sample statistic would be a measure used to describe a sample, right? And you remember from the last screen, we said that a sample is just a smaller subset used to represent the population. So people do this all the time with the Dow Jones, for example. We look at the 30 largest stocks as um, an indication of how the overall stock market did on any given day. It's just a representation of the larger sample rather than looking at the average mean return of the whole U.S. market. Once we have data, how can we make it most visually appealing and intuitively easy to understand for us? Well, we can put it into a frequency distribution. Uh, a frequency distribution is a tabular presentation of data and it's used to essentially aid in the analysis. Now, there's three steps to creating a frequency distribution. The first one is defining the intervals. So we're gonna say, let's say if we're talking about returns, we might have a bucket from negative 5% to 0% and then another bucket from 0% to 5%. And you'll see on the next screen, it'll become more intuitively easy to understand. Um, the second step is tally the observations. So all the observations that fit into this bucket tally each time so we can come up with a total number in that bucket. And third step, count the observations to figure out the total amount. Now let's see visually how this is done. And to plot our frequency distribution, we're just going to plot the counts on this graph. So we know from our negative 5 to 0 bucket, we had 4 observations. So here, in this bucket, we had 4 observations. In the 0 to 5 bucket, we had 2 observations. So here from 0 to 5, we're going to two observations. And then from 5 to 10, we had two observations as well. And there we have it, a frequency distribution that we just plotted. Relative frequency breaks the buckets into percentages of the total. So in our previous example, we had the count for each of these buckets. And so we knew there was two in this bucket, two in this bucket, and four in this bucket. That means there's eight total observations. So our relative frequency for each bucket is the count in that bucket divided by the total number of observations. So for 5% to 10%, that bucket, we have 25% relative frequency. For 0 to 5%, we have 25% relative frequency because 2 divided by 8 observations. And then for the negative 5% to 0%, we had 4 observations out of the 8 total, which is a 50% relative frequency. Now, if we plot that, we'll see in our 0 to 5 bucket, we're going to have 50%. 
and then in our uh or our yeah negative five to zero bucket sorry we had 50 percent from our in our zero to five bucket we had 25 percent and then in our uh five to ten bucket we had 25 percent and it ends up looking like the absolute frequency distribution we did in the previous page but we're actually working in percentages now now you'll see that I added a column on the right called cumulative relative frequency. So here we're basically starting from the lowest bucket, moving up to the highest bucket, and counting the cumulative percentage of observations that we've seen by the time we've come to that bucket, right? So we'll start with the lowest bucket. We know our relative frequency for that bucket is 50%. So we're just going to go right here and put 50%. Now we're going up to the next highest bucket, which is 0% to 5%. We know 25% of the returns are in this bucket. So our cumulative relative frequency for this bucket will be the 50% from the bucket below it plus 25%, which gives us 75%. And now we're going to the highest bucket, and we know before we've seen this bucket, we've seen 75%. So we're going to do 75% plus the 25% relative frequency of this bucket. Which gets us to 100% cumulative frequency for that bucket. Okay, so now let's go plot this. So our negative 5 to 10% bucket. Oh, and also let me add that this is now the cumulative relative frequency on this axis. Okay, so for this bucket, we have 50%. Now from zero to five, we see we have 75%. So let's add, uh, let's add this. So you see how this graph is just increasing as the buckets get higher essentially. And then from the 5% to 10% bucket, we have 100%. So there, now we've plotted our cumulative uh, relative frequency distribution. So here we're going to be talking about the different types of measurement. The key thing to keep in mind is that when I'm starting at one, I'm starting with the lowest level of information or the lowest level of measurement, and then I'm going down to the highest level. Okay, so number one, the least amount of information is a nominal scale. There is no order to this. I think of it like dummy variable. So you could say, Let's assign every stock to category one and every bond to category two. It doesn't really provide much useful information other than that those are dummy variables. Um, for the second one is ordinal scales. So every observation is assigned to a category, then the categories are ordered. Okay, so an example of this would be if you take 100 stocks, you find what their return was for the previous year, and then you put them into um, two different buckets, essentially. The top 50 stocks, those are assigned to bucket one, and then the bottom 50 stocks, those are assigned to bucket two, and so they're somewhat ordered that, and categorized, so that's an ordinal scale. Um, the third level is interval scale, which is a relative ranking. And it's like the ordinal scale, but uh, scale value differences are equal. So you could think of this like temperature. So 50 degrees Fahrenheit is 10 degrees above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And 40 degrees Fahrenheit is 10 degrees above 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So the difference between those two is equal. And that's what an interval scale is. So it's ordered. Um, and then the ratio scale, so four, this is the highest level of measurement, and it provides equal differences and rankings. So the way that you can remember for your test, um, the order of highest to lowest level of information is I think of this word noir. So I don't know if you guys ever played that old video game, L.A. Noir. So N-O-I-R, and that's just the first letter of each of these words and that will give you the order of quality of measurement. Moving on to measures of central tendency. Measures of central tendency are ways to find the center of a data set essentially. So the first one we'll talk about is population mean. So this is the average value of all observations in the population. 
Um, sample mean is the same thing except for it's the average value of all the observations in the sample, right? And we said the sample was just a smaller subset of the population. Um, and then median is the midpoint of the whole data set. We'll go into further detail on this in the next screen. And then mode is the most frequent value of the data set. So let's look at a set of data and find mean, median, and mode. All right, guys, here is our sample data set. Let's find mean, median, and mode, starting with the mean. So to find the mean, we're just gonna find the average of this data set. Now, if you use a calculator, you'd realize that the sum of all of these values is actually 45. So we're gonna take the sum of all the values and we're gonna divide it by the total number of observations in the data set. And for this one, we know there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 45 divided by 9, and we end up with a mean value equal to 5. Now for median, this one's very simple. We're just going to take the midpoint of the data set. So we know we have 9 observations. That means the fifth one is the median value. It's in the middle of the data set. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we know this one right here is our median. And for mode, all we're going to do is select the value that is most frequently occurring in the data set. We see that we have three threes, we have two fours. So we know that three is actually the most frequently occurring number in the whole data set and therefore our mode is three. Weighted mean is a measure that finds the average of a data set by weighting each observation differently. Um, here is the formula, right? So weighted mean is basically just weight of observation 1 times the value of observation 1 plus the weight of observation 2 times the value of observation 2. And then you go all the way out to the nth observation, which is the final observation. So this is something you're going to see all the time in finance and in the CFA uh, program. And so it's it better be something you're very familiar with doing because you're going to see it on every test a bunch of times. So here's let's let's take the weighted mean. So you you could say I have a an example a portfolio that has a, a stocks uh, weighting forty percent of the total portfolio that return ten percent and bonds that are weighted 60% of the portfolio, so the remaining portion of the portfolio, and it only returns 1% in this bond component. So what is our uh, weighted mean here? Let's find that down here at the bottom. So our stocks return 10%, but they only weight 40% of the portfolio. So that is going to give us a weighted component of 4% if we multiply those two together. And then bonds make up 60% of our portfolio, but they only return 1%. And so our total mean expected return would be 4.6%. We have two more mean measurements we need to talk about. The first is a geometric mean, which is used to measure compound growth rates or returns. So here I have the formula. So G is just the geometric mean. And basically, you're just going to take the value of each observation one at a time and multiply them all together. And then finally, once you have the sum of all of those, you're going to... Um, take an exponent to the one of n, okay? And then for harmonic mean, it's typically used for the average cost of shares outstanding. I'm not gonna lie that this one is pretty weird and I've always had a hard time memorizing it. So the harmonic mean is equal to n. So this is just the total number of observations in your data set. So let's say if you had five observations, then n would be five and then you would have the first one. Um, so 1 over the f first value plus 1 over the second value plus 1 over the third value and all the way to the last one. And that is just the denominator. It's just something you got to memorize. Guys, and lastly, we're talking about variance and standard deviation. So these are just measures used to see how spread out our data is, okay? So if, if all of your data is more pocketed together, you're gonna to have a lower standard deviation of variance. If everything is spread out, you're gonna have higher standard deviation and variance. 
So first we'll talk population variance, which is just symbolized by this. So it's sigma squared, and it is the average of the squared deviations from the mean. So let me walk you through this formula, which is population variance. So population variance here, so uh, sigma squared essentially is equal to, it's a summation of all of the observations minus the mean, right? So this u is the mean. So we're finding a value of an observation, subtracting it from the mean value, so we're finding the difference between it and the mean, and then we're squaring it. So we're gonna take the square of that difference. We're gonna do that for every single observation, sum all of them up, and then divide by the total number of observations n. I'm gonna show you a really easy way to do this on your TI calculator because it is a pain to calculate this by hand. And then the population standard deviation is just the square root of the variance, okay? So always remember that standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. You see that this exponent here would be canceled out by the square root there, and that is standard deviation. Now let's see how you can calculate this on your TI BA2 plus calculator. Okay guys, here we are calculating standard deviation with our BA2 plus calculator. Let's assume we have a data set with four observations and we'll say they are four, five, six, and seven. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go second data, so here on, on the seven, and then I'm gonna go four, enter, I'll go down to X2, and I'll do five, enter, and I'll go down, down to X3, six, enter, down, down, to x7 or x4 and I'll put in 7 enter okay so now we have our four observations in there now we're gonna go second stat and we're just gonna scroll down to our standard deviation we see that for this data set of four observations we have a standard deviation of 2.4166 and that is a shortcut